Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 9, John William Wade. John William, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, John William, where's your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, it comes from my family. Um, I was uh, raised uh, in a family where um, we believed in really hard work. Um, and that if you have certain gifts, that you're, you have those gifts to serve others. So one of the leadership rules that my family always had when they were teaching leadership was service above self. And so that just came. And so even when we got into, um, into school, we were always volunteering around our neighborhood. Um, when I had a lawn mowing service when I was an elementary kid right through junior high and high school, there was always a couple of people who we had to do it for free. So, so that's kind of where it started. And then we, we go through it. And then you learn that as you start to uh, serve other people around your community, uh, it's, it's like the, the tide raises, raises all the boats together. You could have given back in many different ways through nonprofit organizations, through business, and I understand you are a business owner, but you could have, could have given back in many ways. But you've decided in 2021, you would throw your hat in the ring for Ward 9 City Council candidate uh, for City Council. Why did you decide 2021 was the, an appropriate time to get involved and give back in a political way? Well, uh, I'm a lot of what the reason why was determined by my involvement with nonprofit organizations. I used to be the head of fund development for the Calgary Seniors Resources Society here in Calgary. They're the outbound version of the Kirby Center. And so they help seniors age in place, which in this area of the city, there are quite a few seniors. Um, so I was already involved with trying to make it easier for seniors to live on their own. Um, also, uh, the probably the most pertinent fact is that I am uh, the secretary of the Cal of the International Avenue uh, BRZ, which is Business Revitalization Zone. I've been on that board now for nine years, and so what they do is they represent the 420 plus or minus businesses along the strip of 17th Avenue, which is a main commercial drag for Ward Nine. And so having seen all that, we've gone through in the last nine years, we've seen uh, where the Vagabond trailer park used to be, is now a no frills. We've seen a lot of improvement along the avenue um, because you know, it used to be considered forest lawn was uh, so close to downtown, but was uh, considered to be the weakest part of Calgary. And we've taken it and we've now read done a whole lot of the strip. It, we've spent millions and millions of dollars, uh, you know, about $180 million all in to redo the whole avenue with the, with the uh, bus rapid transit, um, sewage, water, a lot of different things. But now in the last three years, we've seen a bit of a backslide in the area, which has been concerning. Um, and I think if I really had to pinpoint the exact time, I think everybody kind of agrees. It's usually, they will indicate about a year and a half to two years ago is where they started to notice a drop off in service at the city council level. So we'd just spent millions of dollars trying to redo the area. And then we're starting to see a reduction in service at, this, at the city level. And so when we see that, I, I didn't, I, I'd like to think I didn't spend nine years volunteering uh, to just see it backslide. Now, just just to, for clarification, for those people who might not understand what the what you mean by uh, uh, the reduction in services from City Hall, what do you mean by that when it comes to the 17th Ave? Just for those people who might not know, because when you asked that, when you said yep. that, I was like, I, I don't know what that means. So I'm yep, assuming exactly. some listeners might not know. Well, I mean, we would start to see, um, we started to see, because Ward 9 is a, is a very unique ward in Calgary. It's a mix of, it goes, it has right from Renfrew, Bridgeland, uh, you know, uh, Inglewood and Ramsey, which is the inner city area and really the, the beginning point of Calgary. And then swings all the way down 9th Avenue, down through Forest Lawn and 17th Avenue, right to Bellevue on the Ring Road, and then south to Glenmore Trail, and then back west again to McLeod Trail. It's a huge ward with a lot of, with a very diverse population. <laughs> so, What's happened is we've noticed that uh, we've seen an increase in uh, social disorder in the area. 
And when I may, when I mention these things, it's not to put the area down. Obviously, it's to it's to highlight that maybe not all is well. And once we understand that, then we can start to identify solutions to the problem and then move forward with that action. But if we continue to put on our heads in the sand uh, like an ostrich, we still have to remember that our butts are still in the air. So. Um, so basically, we've seen that when we've talked about some of the social disorder that's increased or the crime that's increased in the area, and uh, some of the reports that I've looked at through the Calgary Police uh, website has been an increase of a, as much as nine times what it was three or four years ago. Okay, so that, that's a, a, a huge increase. Yes, some of it can be explained with, uh, with COVID, but uh, I mean, it, it far outstrips parts of the city. And again, being so close to downtown, what we've seen is that some of the homelessness that was downtown has been driven into our area. And so by doing that, uh, by driving it up the hill, you know, it doesn't eliminate the problem. It just kind of hides it from Inglewood and Ramsey and that, that area. But we have to understand that we're all the same city. And when we have a problem in one area, we have a problem everywhere. You have just uh, talked about a few items that I want to talk about through the interview, but there's one area that I want to start off with first. Um, as a candidate, uh, you've mentioned that you are talking to people, and if you're not talking to people as a candidate, you're doing your job wrong, and I will be the first to admit that. Are you hearing from the residents of Ward 9 what you expected to hear, or are there things that you are shocked about that you're saying, I've never thought of it that way, or I never thought that this was an issue that Ward 9 was facing. And I'm glad to hear that these issues are coming up because I want to bring that forward because it has not been addressed. Um, uh, it's a little of both uh, because of course, being on the International Avenue BRZ, where we represent 17th Avenue and, and adjoining roads and the businesses, we've been hearing this along the whole time. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I've had little indi individual shocks because I, I have noticed uh, where I've been most shocked has been when there's been individual citizens who are volunteers in the area. So they might be a part of a community association or they might be part of another uh, BRZ or BIA in another area of the ward have been accused of uh, different things that you know are almost labeled if they disagree with what the city council is trying to do for that area and that confounds me greatly because i the, my understanding of democracy is that it's the people who are in charge and as a representative of those people you have to listen to them now you may not listen to you know of course listening I mean, there's a plurality of different opinions in an area. So it, you know, sometimes you may be listening to one area and not the other, but, but there has to be that effort. But when there's uh, certain areas, for example, I'll give you a, one example that really, I knew it had happened, so it wasn't so shocking. But then when I see some of the behind the scenes things that went on uh, from listening to the people, that's where the shock has come from. But for example, in Inglewood on uh, Ninth Avenue, there was a redevelopment or sorry, um, a rezoning that was uh, approved on, on, on three different sites along the avenue. Now, back in 2014, Inglewood was considered to be the number one neighborhood in all of Canada. OK, and now one of the reasons why it was one of the it was the number one neighborhood in all of Canada was because of its historic nature of Ninth Avenue, where you have all these storefronts that have really maintained uh, that that uh, that historic look that vibrancy and you have a lot of different shops along the area that are quite unique that you can't get those items anywhere else in the city. So you can go ahead and shop at Walmart or Home Depot and there's nothing wrong with those businesses at all. However, if you want some of those unique experiences, the only place you're gonna get that in one of the areas is Ninth Avenue in Inglewood. So when the, uh, now the other thing that's also important to understand is there have been TV series that have been filmed there because of its historic nature. So uh, one of the TV series that was filmed very recently was Fargo. And so Fargo was filmed all up and down that strip because it has so much, so much uh, store frontage uh, that's classical in nature that they can use very easily. They don't have to screenshot and, and try to use uh, CGA to, to change it. So it reduces a lot of the cost of filming in the industry there. So then when the, the uh, idea was brought up to read 
zone a couple of areas. One was right at the beginning of the strip, one was down the end, and then one was pretty much in the middle. <clears throat> so if you rezone both of the, all three of those areas, you've now created a situation where it is possible that someone will come in and want to fill, want to build a, a, a large a large edifice there, which would destroy all the storefronts. And then, it, of course, it'll be a different fascia than what's typically there. So then you've now, you know, at the attempt of trying to have a large development on one area, you've now destroyed possibly a whole industry for that area, which has been filming. Now, not just that that part was, that's not the shocking part. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't sh shock me that people who are not involved in real estate would maybe make those decisions. However, what really shocked me was that they, the, the uh, president of the, of the Community Association for Inglewood and the heads of the business, uh, of the BIA, the, you know, which is the same as the BRZ in, in International Avenue, had taken their blood, sweat and tears to canvas the area, to, to get certain, they had, they had uh, gotten a survey done, not just of its own residents, but they had actually taken the time to get letters from Hollywood to show that why they use that area for filming, right? Yeah. I mean, these people have gone way above and beyond without any payment at all and showed that it was clear that that area of the city was very much against this whole rezoning. And so some of them, uh, some of the stories that I've heard from the individuals in the area was that they would, uh, that they were told, okay, well, we really understand that we're really listening to you. And then their own representative on City Hall went against them and they felt uh, betrayed. And so for me, that's always shocking because uh, I have a political science degree and, you know, the very basic political science 201 is that, you know, democracy, representative democracy, which is what Canada is supposedly is, is supposed to represent the will of the people. And when they've demonstrated, when they've gone to that degree to demonstrate a homogeny of the, of the opinion of the area, then you have to start asking yourself, why are you going against their opinion? So that's, and that's one, that's one example. There's other examples, but. But I'm going to piggyback on that for a second here, because one of the areas that I was going to talk about, and we'll talk about it now is sometimes you will have to disagree with your residents because for yes. the greater good, you will mm -hmm. have to bring things forward that might not be in favor of everyone. And let's be honest, no decision is 100% universally agreed upon. 100%. How do you envision yourself working with people who you may disagree with when it comes to their issues? Will you still bring it forward to council, even though you disagree with it? Or will you sit down with them and have that discussion to say, change my mind? Tell me why I'm wrong here. Well, it can be both, right? And again, when so one of the things is that um, <clears throat> when you have... I, and that's exactly what happened in Inglewood's case is they were told to change their mind and they had and, and they had really shown compelling evidence that the area was far better ahead than rep, than trying to benefit three different developers who wanted to get a rezoning and make a make a an upswing on the value of the property and sell it off, which is what's happened. OK, so when they when they rezone the property, the, the property now with a higher zoning is worth more money. They can sell it off, which was done. Someone made a profit on that, and now it's still sitting there with the same building, but with the potential, with the latent potential to be something else that you know maybe the residents are going to be part of it, maybe they're not. Now, I'm not saying that uh, I'm not a believer of um, you know uh, mob rule, where whatever the majority says that because we always we have a representative democracy which which is uh, under charter and we do have the rights of the minorities that are also you know that is also always protected now in real estate the one thing i have always learned is that if one side feels that they're getting the short the true short end of the stick whether it's the buyer or the seller then there will be no deal so my my whole career in 16 years of real estate has been about reaching across the table trying to listen intently to what not just what the other side is saying but sometimes what they're not saying and trying to anticipate that to bring them together now so when you were saying that i might ask for someone to change my mind that's done all the time uh, it's done before we get to the deal table 
So yeah, we, try, yeah. we try to talk about it and see what can be done, what's the overall goal, and, and maybe this whole deal doesn't even fit their goal. So we can save ourselves a whole lot of time without even approaching the other side. But if we can see that, that there's a possibility of a deal, then we start bringing people together to negotiate it out. And then once we get to a certain uh, time where we can put it together, then we start involving other parties. So for example, in a commercial deal, we can end up having a landlord, we can end up having a property management company, we, we can have up to four or five lawyers on a deal, a franchisor, but we don't want to start disturbing all these other parties if at the essence, the buyer and the seller are, are not going to agree anyway. <clears throat> True. Um, one of the other areas that you spoke about in your opening statement there was the safety. There's a concern that, uh, and I'm from Ward 10, and before I moved to Ward 10, I did the research and I looked at the police stats and mm -hmm. I saw that some areas are higher in crime than others. Yes. How do you envision yourself working with your fellow counselors, if you're the successful candidate on October 18th, to make our community safer? So there's a, it, it's a multi-layered uh, uh, strategy. So for example, in, and again, I've learned a whole heck of a lot by being part of the International Avenue BRZ, because for me, I grew up in Oak Ridge Estates. Okay, so very far away from Forest Lawn and, and any of the issues that they deal with. And in fact, when I was growing up, um, you know, I, I, open, I am very open about this. We used to joke about the area and certainly we would not go over there. Now, that is where it led me to believe that as I get older and you get a little bit more mature, hopefully, uh, you, <laughs> you start to say, I, I'd like to think I'm getting more mature, but <laughs> I'll, I'll let other people decide that for me. Um, but as we start to do that, we start to understand that these are opportunities that are not just holding the rest of, of Calgary back, but they're, they're an opportunity to launch Calgary forward, right? Because imagine if we didn't have to spend all that time with bylaw or police and fire and all these different things over in the area. I mean, one thing I'll note, this will start to, you know, kind of timestamp this interview is, but yesterday we had a fire at a church on, on Forgo Avenue in, in Forest Lawn, you know, and so, you know, we see these different things. Yes, it's not just that area, but there does tend to be some patterns. So one of the patterns that can be available is that we need to start looking at the opportunities to beautify the area, okay? So, but before we beautify the area, one of the opportunities that we really need to do is reach across the table and start bringing the commercial, the businesses and the business owners and the, and the landlords to the table to start being part of the solution. Because if you, have a, if you have houses that are boarded up, it's kind of like the broken window principle, right? You see a broken window, next thing you know that someone else starts doing some other things to the building and then it progresses and then it becomes an area that it starts to spread around the area. So part of my platform is that we are, are going to encourage beautification of the area through having people who stand up and become the local heroes, whether they be landlords or they become business owners, get them rewarded for what they've done. So what do I mean by that? Well, currently we need to look at the taxation system of Calgary. Now I know a taxation is not the sexiest thing to look at, I understand that. But I also think it's, it's very simplistic to just say, well, I'm a candidate that believes in higher taxes or I'm a candidate who believes in lower taxes. That's so oversimplified. It demonstrates to me a fundamental disconnect between that candidate and the reality of the system. What really needs to happen is the system itself needs to be revamped. And why do we talk about it? Because most of the budget for Calgary comes from property taxes. So now it, you'll see where I come from with real estate. And I think that's so important that of what I bring to the to City Hall is an, a fundamental understanding of how the taxation system works from a real estate per perspective, not just residentially, but also commercially. So for example, right now, if I am a business owner and, or let's say I'm a commercial landlord who also owns the business and I do a big renovation on my building, Okay. So a big renovation, maybe $300,000 or, you know, that's a medium sized. Suddenly my building will be deemed to be worth more money. So what happens? I just spent $300,000 beautifying my building. Now I get a, a tax receipt that says now my building is worth more money. 
And because it's worth more money, I now have to pay more tax. Nothing is, is more conflicting than our system because if somebody has done a beautification of their building, following the pattern that we had earlier talked about where we said that if a building is all boarded up or a derelict building, it starts to attract the wrong attention. Well, then the opposite would be true if you beautify the building. So they're now going to need less bylaw calls. They're going to need less calls from police and fire and, and different uh, organizations and even, and, and because of that, they're partaking less in the, in the uh, social services because of what they've done with the preemptive uh, beautification, but they're paying more money. And yet the person who doesn't spend any money on their building is paying less tax because they've devalued their building and now, and they're taking more advantage of bylaw, police and fire and all the other various services that are related. So it, it's a self-defeating, it's a self-defeating system that we have. The other part, which I, I think if you have any experience with real estate is that the actual appraisal system is with our employees of the city of Calgary. Boy, if I was in real estate, <laughs> I would love to be able to have my own appraisal of my own properties, because I guarantee you my properties would always be worth a lot of money so that I could get as much mortgage as I could get. I would over leverage it. And yet that's our system. And the problem with that is that once the system, you know, the actual fundamental system of how we even get our money is viewed as at least, um, hmm, if they don't look at it as corrupt, if, if they look at it at least as broken, Okay, we'll put it politely for now. We'll say it's broken. Then what happens then is that trickles down to everything else. And then people start to believe that nothing else in the city can be trusted. And because the fundamental thing that this is all being built on is something that does not inspire trust. When the city is the one who determines how much your property is worth. Now, someone will say to you, oh, well, you can go ahead and appeal it. And I have lots of clients who appeal it every single week, every spring. It's a routine. They call me up. They say, can you run the comps? Because again, uh, they've jumped my, my property value $100,000 again. So they go down. And the system right now uh, is that you pay X amount of money. Now, if you're a residential, it's a lot lower. than if you're commercial, it's a lot more. And so they pay money to you know put their, put their uh, chip in the at play to say that they want to appeal it. They spend tons of time, energy, and money. Some of them are more represented than others. On the commercial side, they'll actually be people who they have on retainer annually because they know every year they're going to need to go through the system. Yeah, yeah. And they win the appeal every single year. So, so we talk about not having money. How much, how much does this make sense that you know as a city of Calgary, because they'd have to know or, you're just a, or, or there's something missing in your head, that you've lost the appeal five straight years to this individual. And yet you still continue to put it back up there. Now, the appeal's not free. They, the city of Calgary processes that they'll have a panel of people that they pay to be on the panel, that they pay to go, not just listen at that time, but they'll send them out to take photos. They drive them to these locations. They give them free meals because of course they're doing a service for Calgary and they, it costs quite a bit of money to do this. And depends on how complicated the appeal is would determine how much money. But we're paying money to this appeal board five times for the same property to make less money on taxes. So we've not only made less money on the tax, but we've now paid to do that. So we would have been better off not to even fight them. Just let them have the, the, their, their value that you know, is seen to be fit. So what we would be better off to do from a business perspective is... If somebody, and so this is part of my platform as well, if a, an individual, so if it's residential or on, on the commercial side, which is probably more, more uh, frequent, if you win your appeal, you're going to have an amnesty period from the city of Calgary. It's frozen. City of Calgary can't even touch or reevaluate the value of your property, can't even touch it. Because it's okay. silly to be focusing these business owners who have staff who also have their own families who are relying on this business owner to be fully focused and engaged on their business to provide for everybody in the community, sitting there fighting on an annual basis about something that should not have had to be fought over in the first place. So there's an old, uh, there's an old expression in, in the Maritimes that, you know, what should be offered should not have to be asked for. Right. And so what, what I mean by that is if you know, and the city does, uh, one of my clients actually this year back in February 
ask for their, you know, they live over in Renfrew. Okay. So that's an award nine, uh, yeah. uh, owner community. They, they, they received, you know, they asked me, I said, okay, so my development property, uh, has been put up to $700,000 again. It's a fifth straight year. And last year it was 570,000. Can you please give me the comparables for the June of the previous year, you know, June, July of that year? So we do that. And when he called, it was almost like they were waiting for me. Oh yes, you call every year, don't you? And he goes, yes. And I'm getting kind of tired of it because you keep putting it back down to 575, 80. And so I'm just wondering why, why you're doing this. And they said, well, that's the way it is. And but you know, now that you've called, we'll, you know, we won't force you to have to go through the whole appeal board this time. We'll just give it to you now. Okay, but that doesn't inspire confidence because he happened to be someone who's knowledgeable enough and have the time and energy to actually call in and fight it. What about all the other people who don't do that? And when they hear about these things, it starts to break down. It shows that it's not an impartial system, although... I, anytime human beings are involved, it's never going to be 100% impartial. I, I acknowledge that. But we can have systems that reduce the partiality of, of a system. And so I think one of those areas is to, is to, if the city gets it wrong, then you now have an amnesty period. My suggestion would be three years where you're frozen. And but, so, but yes. Just on that note, I apologize for interrupting. Just on that note. Yes. What, what happens then if someone comes in and says, okay, I'm going to add to my building. I'm in that amnesty period. I have mm -hmm. five years yep. where they can't touch me and I can go about doing whatever I want to my building now. Right. What, right. what happens then? Because now they can go in yep. and they can beautify it. They can expand, they can right. add things. And then what, did, what, what happens to that tax revenue? Because then therefore we're potentially losing tax revenue because they're in that amnesty period. And I'm just asking the question for the uh, potential yep. listeners. No, no, who it's are a saying, fair question. It's a fair question. And, and so I, I don't, I think it would be no different than any other system that we have where like, if we're going to sweet something, uh, you know, that's, or if it's not, if it's sweeted prior to a certain date, it's grandfathered. But if you do a substantial change to the property, then all bets are off, right? There's no reason why we couldn't add that uh, grandfathering clause to it. That's also why we would only have it for a, a temporary period. It's not a permanent, you know, permanency with the, with the property, maybe the amnesty period. Again, I'm open to listening to the business owners and to property owners in the area, but I mean, you know, maybe two, three years that they would have this amnesty period. Now, uh, if you're doing a substantial addition to a building, typically it's it, right now because the city of Calgary is not super fast, you're looking at a, about a year anyway, just to just to get all the permits and to get it to get it done. So you know your loss on on the possible revenue is mm, it's going to be minimal, even if you didn't have a grandfathering. But I would suggest that we would have a grandfathering if you do a substantial change, then we'd have to reevaluate it. But it but quite often none of these building owners have not done anything to their building and they have to do an annual fight it's almost like the city is trying to wear them down hope that they forget hope that they may get sick or pass away or something where they just don't fight anymore and that that's just not ethical because again One, if you have to remember these people are citizens of calgary that the city is supposed to be working for them not the other way around one of the big things that you'll be dealing with as the next counselor for ward nine is covid19 and the recovery from covid19 mm -hmm. Um, we have businesses that have closed up shop because of the restrictions and the not restrictions, the restrictions and the, the unknown, and they just can't afford to work anymore. And they had to close up shop. We have, we have residents who are leaving town because they can't afford to live in Calgary anymore, who are moving from housing to rentals. How do you envision yourself working with the next council to ensure everyone gets a fair share of recovery and no one gets left behind? Well, again, it has to be, first of all, we stop by not labeling each other. Okay. So sometimes what happens is, and unfortunately, it's, this is not just endemic to Canada, it's, you know, the United States as well. And we've got such an Americanization of some of our media now that we tend to find quick and easy labels for people. You know, oh, you're a, you know, you're a podcaster. Okay, but why don't I just say you're a human being and that happens to do podcasting? Or why don't I say some, something like, you know, this is a person when it comes to COVID, this is a, not an anti-vaxxer or a pro-masker or, you know, we start to throw all these labels around. Why don't we just say this is an individual who lives in Ward 9 or who lives in Calgary that happens to disagree with the need to mandate masks 
for. This is an individual who still feels that we need to have masks on. You know, so once we start dis, you know, getting rid of the labels, then we can start to say, okay, now you've now humanized the person that you're dealing with. And once people realize that you're dealing with a human being, then they start to come to the table and start dealing with each other fairly and equitably. So that's the first thing you have to do. Next, what happens is you start to see what are the strengths and weaknesses of the area and what are the needs? Because if you have a blanket solution that where it's a one, one solution fits all, you're right. There's gonna be people who need more and there's gonna be people who needed less than what was offered. So if we can start to look and, and start to talk to the stakeholders of the area, they'll start to provide that information. So we really have to get to where we're truly listening to the people and, st and, and stakeholders. So then that way we can come up with solutions that are handcrafted for the areas. So one example is uh, again, um, I guess I'll go to Inglewood again here, is that they're swimming, we're, we're asking Inglewood to, lit the schedule of uh, development is to literally double the density of Inglewood. Okay. Now, whether you agree with that or not, that is what's planned for the area. Yet we're taking away their swimming pool. Hmm, interesting. So we want to have double, we, we want to almost create two neighborhoods on top of one another and yet take away their services from the area. Why? Because that swimming pool happens to not be as used at this time as maybe some other swimming pools. You know, that, and so what happens is, and that's being blamed on COVID. So it's still related to your question. It's, blame, it's being blamed on COVID. <clears throat> but what's happening then is, and again, why is this so important? Again, when you go back to real estate and you're doing to development, any developer who's doing a new, a new region has to buy, you know, buy the regulations of the city of Calgary, provide a certain amount of green space, provide a certain amount of parks, provide a certain amount of areas for schools and community centers. That's all pre-planned at the, at the development stage. And so what we're, <clears throat> but what we're not doing is we're not requiring that when we're, when we're densifying the, the, in, the inner city areas, we're actually reducing their services. So that's, that's a major problem because you can have a bunch of people piled up on one another in an area, but if you take away all their social services, what kind of an area do you have? What kind of quality of life do you have? And quality of life has to be something that we, that we promote as leaders of city of Calgary. And if we do that, you know, especially swimming, I mean, swimming would be a very healthy activity to keep your body in good shape so that you don't get sick and then have to go to the hospital and start using more money that way, right? So we're doing things that are fairly short-sighted without really understanding the full domino effect and the unintended consequences from our actions. One of the big things that you'll be dealing with is uh, the green line. The Green Line is yes. a massive uh, endeavor that the city has undertaken. It seems to be the project that just seems to not want to go anywhere. The Green Line will be going through part of your ward. Correct. Nine. Yes. What are you hearing from residents about the Green Line and from businesses about the Green Line? Are they in favor of it? Are they just like me, just get the shovel in the ground and get it going? What are their feelings? Well, again... Uh, I've heard a lot of different opinions on it. It's a, it's a very, um, hmm. it's a very interesting topic that has not inspired a lot of confidence in the city of Calgary's ability to lead. So again, if you were building something or you're doing a renovation on your house, let's take it to the most, the simplest form. You're doing a renovation on your house. You will talk to your contractor, look at different options, and you'll hear an approximate quote as to what it will cost. Now, I've done enough renovations to know that they never really end right on cost. I, I think it's kind of a foregone conclusion, unfortunately. But there's a but there's a certain level of threshold that you'll accept as a deviation from the original cost. So if the contractor were to say to you that installing your basement is going to cost thirty or thirty-five thousand dollars, and it came out at thirty-eight thousand, that's pretty close. But if that if that contractor got halfway through the project and said, well, I thought it was going to cost about 35000 but, you know, I'm halfway done, I've ripped it open, and now it's going to cost $80,000. That's not an acceptable, no one in business would say that that's an acceptable practice, and you would be expected to boot them out and, and deal with them in appropriate fashion. So with the green line, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger project, granted, 
But again, it still comes down to having people come with a very realistic number of how it's going to cost. We've never been able to ha hammer that down. And it continues to balloon. Why does it continue to balloon? Well, sometimes when the reason why it continues to balloon is that we don't want to necessarily listen to experts or, you know, or different interests start to say, well, can you move this here? Can you do that? Can you add this? And so originally, if we look at the, the origin of the green line, it was only supposed to be the Southeast line of the city of Calgary. And Southeast has been determined to be the single most uh, populous area with the least amount of service for public transportation in the whole area. And it was supposed to go down right down to uh, the South Campus Hospital in, on, in Seton, you know, Auburn Bay there. And that was what was because we already have two lines that do circulate through the north. We have one in the northwest and we have one in the northeast. No, we do not have one that goes to the center. And I understand that the, uh, the origin of the idea came from the councillors of the area because the center street, if you look way back in history of Calgary, used to be a trolley street. So they're looking at that going, well, it was a trolley street at one time, so we could go back to doing that. Now, if we had a lot of money and we had the ability to do that, then fine, no problem. But once we started, I, I believe that a lot of it, what, what happened with this, the, the construction costs and the, and the lack of clarity on the, on the project was the whole crossing over the river. Okay, that has been where, that's been the lightning rod of the whole project. Do we go over the river? Do we go under the river? Uh, you know, do we even go over the river? Maybe we have two lines that just meet downtown. I mean, that's everything has been discussed. So once we had that, then the other problem was we didn't really know where the money was going to come from. So we started appro approving a project, hoping that money might come. Um, I know where that where that happens in, in my industry. If you just hope that the money might come, sometimes you're lucky, uh, but a lot of times you're not. And so now you're sitting there with a project that's half finished. And so that's so that's been the other issue. But again, it gets back to the fundamental issue that I that we've seen that there's been a, a, a stark increase in a sharp increase in people not trusting the city of Calgary and their ability to lead on big projects. Because if you look back in history of Calgary, we've always been a can do city. You know, we, you know, we look back and, and people go, well, yeah, we can do this. And if you look at the incredible thing, I mean, we had the 1988 winter Olympics when we were less than half the size that we are today. And we put that on and there was no, you know, there was no doubt that we were going to do that, but somewhere along the line, and I would argue that when you have a lack of clarity on the taxation and what's done with the money and all these things, that when you do get to these other projects, what are you seeing the fight about? The fight is not necessarily about the fact that public transportation is good or bad. The fight is around the money. Do we have the money or should we spend that kind of money? And people don't have a, a fundamental trust in the leadership of Calgary today to make those decisions. And that's unfortunate because you're right. There's some times where you have to, uh, as a leader, go forward on something. But when you haven't built up the goodwill from other smaller promises, then when you get to the big promises, you'll, you'll see people jerk back. So how do you envision yourself changing that narrative? Because one of the things I hear from can can candidates from across the city is there is a lack of trust and there's a lack of transparency mm -hmm. within City Hall. How do you envision yourself changing that narrative and bringing back the trust to the people of Ward 9? And because you are not just there to represent Ward 9, you're there to represent all of Calgary as well. How do you mm -hmm. envision yourself bringing back that trust and transparency? Okay, well, I mean, first of all, I've already, we already had a bit of a discussion about it. Yeah. And that's revamping how we get the money. You know, if, if we can revamp how we get the money for the city of Calgary, where it's not just who you know, or how much you know that determines how much tax you're going to pay, but it's actually based on a system where we take it out of the hands of the city of Calgary de de to determine how much money that they're going to charge you. Okay. We start having uh, private appraisal companies who do that because it, you know, they're looking for business always. So why not just support them? And then if the, if the appeals process gets, uh, let's say you have nine different appeal um, appraisal companies that you divide the work amongst the city. And one of those appeal comp and one of those appraisal companies has a, a large number of appeals that go against their work. Then next year, you just don't use that company again. I mean, that's, that's the free market. I mean, there has to be consequences for your action. When people start to see systems that kind of, at, at least at, you know, pass the smell test of logic, then you start to see, oh, okay, well, there's a change here, right? That would grab their attention immediately, that there's going to be a move towards transparency. Then we need to start to have 
uh, you know, then we need to start to truly listen and keep track of the conversations that we're having with stakeholders. Now, I'm not saying that every single person, every human being is important, of course, but there are some people who tend to represent the groups of people a little bit more. So that's why we call them more stakeholders, right? And so we need to start talking to them and listening to them. I happen to be one of the stakeholders of Ward 9. By, my, by virtue of me being on the board of directors for the BRZ. But for example, there's a document called the Great Neighborhoods Document, okay? Now, we, now they swore up and down that they, had, that they had done their due diligence with the stakeholders of the area, okay? Now, the, the International Avenue BRZ is a zoning referee for the area. Nothing happens in that area without going to the BRZ first, okay? And yet we had, hmm, I'll be generous and I'll say we had three weeks with the document when it was already constructed. So their version of consulting with us was to have a completed document, gave it to us, and we had literally three weeks. Now, we only meet once a month, you know, to begin. So we actually had to have a special meeting to look at the document and then come up with what we thought was best. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very, very long book, you know, a document if you haven't seen it. So that's not stakeholder engagement. Right. You know, when you've already constructed it and then say now you've got three weeks to make a, a yay or a nay, that's not engagement. Engagement is at the beginning fundamental area. So listening to the different areas. Hey, what does your area need? You don't have to talk to every single individual. That's not, you know, you know, this isn't the way it works. But you, there are certain obvious people and certain obvious groups that you would consult with. And, and most of them were not consulted. If you go to the uh, if you go to rent, uh, uh, Inglewood again, uh, they're very organized uh, uh, groups as well. They weren't adequately, uh, they'll, they'll tell you they did not have public engagement. So if they had a, an engagement where they tick off the boxes because they say, okay, public engagement is something that we need to do, they'll tick off a box. Um, perhaps, you know, maybe they had their engagement at a community center, um, you know, on the night of the Super Bowl Sunday or something, and, oh, maybe two people showed up. But they can tick off the box that they had the engagement. There's no necessity to show how many people came or what the opinions were. What we need to change then is if we really are truly listening, because again, in real estate, if I don't listen to people in real estate, I don't get paid. Yeah. I make nothing. There is no salary. And that's the, that's the desperation that we need to show in our listening as leaders of City Hall is we're that desperate to truly listen to the people and represent them. And when people start to see that, in, you know, that the intentionality behind listening and that you've changed this, the fundamental tax structure that the whole thing is built on, and then as well start to have the, the uh, budgets published to the public in a, in a format that's easier to understand. Okay, because yes, you can you can go through the freedom of information and you can download it. Um, there's different versions, but they make it so complicated. I read financial statements of different businesses all the time because we buy and sell companies with people. And believe me, if you want to make your financial statement difficult to understand, you can. And I think that's what the city of Calgary is, ex is exceedingly good at. But it, what we need to do is get to where someone with an, uh, you know, a normal grade school education can start to understand it, accompany it with an, with an explanation. So not just the numbers, but start to accompany it with an explanation and push it to the people, not just make it available, but show an intentionality that we want to get it to you every single year because these are your monies being spent and this is why. But currently that's not being done. So if we start to do that, the, the trust will start to come and, and people start to feel that there's the possibility for change, which is what I'm, which I really believe is what people are voting for this time is vote, voting for change is then once they start to sense that there's that true opportunity at change, you'll start to see opinions and you'll start to see people come together to really push the city forward again. Put on your magic thinking hat here. October yes. 19th, you are officially the councillor elect for Ward 9. What is your first mm -hmm. priority? Well, my first priority will be to really study up on the committees and how and, and, and to really start to reach out to the different people who won. Because by the 19th, we should know pretty much every single person who's won. Um, there might be one councillor that wins by a very razor mark. You know, they might be still recounting. But my first or you know, duty, just like I do in real estate, is to talk to every single person who won that election and say, congratulations, what, what can we do together? Here's my information. I would like to meet with you and we'll start making appointments to meet right away. I know that we don't get sworn in for a couple of weeks, 
but I think it begins right away to build that personal rapport with all the different people that I'm going to have to start working with now at city city council, because to have a to have the answer where I've seen it, uh, some decisions that were made. Well, we agree that that's a good decision, except she doesn't like him, or he doesn't, or he's friends. Huh? I used to hear that stuff in elementary school or junior high, and so no. But again, I recognize that we're human beings. And so the first order of business is to literally reach out to each person who won, sit down with them and get to know them personally. I'm just cautious of time here. I just want to make sure I get all my questions in. Sure. Um, speak to the people of Ward 9. Why should you be their next counselor? Well, I, I believe that I should be your next counselor because I have been involved at a volunteer level on different, you know, within your ward for, for pretty much a decade now, whether it's been my activities with seniors to make their lives easier so that they don't have to li you know, leave their homes, or if it's been on the International Avenue working with the business communities and the Associated Social Services, it's been about trying to make Ward 9 that shining area of the city of Calgary. Because if we can take Ward 9 and really turn it and make it a leading area leading example of that we can turn things around then there's nothing that the city of calgary can't do and so what my commitment is is that i will always listen and i may not always agree i can't guarantee that that's impossible but i will always truly listen and you will always be responded to in a timely fashion and we will always reach out to follow up with you if something is not completely decided or clear at the end of our conversation that's all and so by doing that, then you will feel validated as a member of Ward 9 and more generally a member of the city of Calgary. And so my, my guarantee is that you'll always feel validated, listened to and served. Now with only a month and a half left until the election, um, people uh, like yourself need volunteers, I'm assuming. People yes. need to reach out as, to as many people as possible. How can people mm. contact you and learn a little bit more about you? Or if they liked what they heard today, get involved in your campaign. Well, you're right. It takes many hands to make this work. So we would we would love it if they if they reached out to our web through our website. It's John William Wade dot ca. So that's J-O-H-N W-I-L-L-I-A-M W-A-D-E ca uh, or they can go out through our social medias uh, all of our social media feeds whether they're facebook instagram or twitter it, uh, you know it's all wade w-a-d-e for ward nine and so they can go through that way too our website actually uh, will also be wade for ward nine.com if you type that in that will not be incorrect it'll find you funnel you in to us but then if they can click on volunteers or if they want signs up you know, if they even want to donate money, because all of this costs money as well, we would be more than happy to have any type of service because it takes all kinds of people to get this going. Uh, for my listeners and to the viewers, uh, John Williams links, uh, the links to John Williams, Instagram, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and website will be in the show notes. So please, if you are in Ward 9, get out, get involved, because this is an important election. Um, and uh, just get get involved and try to figure out who you're going to be supporting because uh, voting matters, and I think everyone should be getting out and voting. Uh, John William, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate that, and, and I agree with you. At the end of the day, it, it's so important whether you vote for me or you vote for anybody else, but at least get out and vote. We need to show that you know the person who gets in to represent Ward 9 or any of the other wards is truly representing the will of the people. And that can only be demonstrated and given true legitimacy if people get out and vote.